Hello, my name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin Beat Media Podcast, a short-form podcast discussing movies, video games, technology, TV, music, and much more. Today, we're going to be talking about my MCU rankings post Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, without spoilers, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, or at least the first 27 hours of the game, True Lies Season 1, actually, series, Ted Lasso Season 3, which also might be its final season, and Maggie Simpson in Rogue Not One. Without further ado, let's get started. But before that, I want to thank my patrons. Specifically, I want to thank Shane Conto. You can see his work on his YouTube channel, The Wasteland Reviewer, and Sif Pop, among many others. I would also like to thank Joseph Davis. You can also find his work on Sif Pop. David Walters, and Beulah Beulah, and Matthew Simpson of Awesome Friday, Tom Blackburn, and Brian Scuttle, all of your... Support helps make this show go, and without you, this wouldn't go on. And for those of you listening who would like to become a patron, you can head to patreon.com slash austin or austinb.media slash support. There's also austinb.media slash contribute, join.austinb.media, and it'll also be in the description of both the show notes here and on YouTube. So without, with that said, let's get into the movie section. All right, so you're going to want to watch the video version to get the full list, but I'll post the link to my letterbox list once this podcast goes live. But here is my un- unadulterated list from highest to lowest. First, obviously, we've got Spider-Man No Way Home. I know that's a controversial opinion nowadays, but honestly, Spider-Man No Way Home is probably one of the best Spider-Man movies I've ever seen. It brought together three Spider-Men and so much more. It is a real celebration of Spider-Man, and I'm one of the biggest Spider-Man fans, although I haven't kept up to date on a lot of the comics, especially apparently there's a Zeb Wells run right now that's being controversial. But uh, yeah, it's... um, Anyways, so that's number one. Number two is the original Guardians of the Galaxy, or I guess you'd refer to it as Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1. It came at a special time in my life where I was having, I was processing the grief from my father passing about a month or two earlier. So it came right right place, right time. Yeah, it just, it it really cemented It's hooks into me, and it also was one of the first MCU movies that didn't feel like an MCU movie. It was funny, didn't really have any huge connections beyond the uh, Ronin and Thanos and the Infinity Stone uh, origin story. So it, it was just a good comic book film, and I think that's what a lot of modern MCU projects have been lacking. Same kind of deal with Ant Man. It remembered to be a comic book movie first, an enjoyable movie first, and then it was a comic book movie. Uh, You can probably liken it to a heist film. I know a lot of people have, and I think with that being the main focus, the main tone of the Ant-Man films, at least for the first two ones, we'll get to Quantumania later. But I, I think that was a good hook because we all love Paul Rudd, we all love a heist film, and it, it just works. It just works. Then we have the TV show, WandaVision. This worked because at the forefront, for me, it was all about grief, as was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, and that just will always work for me. And plus, it focused on two characters of MCU that we really hadn't explored beyond like little bits and pieces. And like Infinity War, Civil War, and a few other movies, Scarlet Witch and The Vision. There is some problems I have with it, with WandaVision, where it's like, hey, we also need this to set up Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, so we need this tag at the end of the thing, and we need to introduce this person, and we need to introduce a sword, and we need to introduce this. It, that part was a bit messy, but y- y- you get it. And then another TV show, Miss Marvel, was really good. Again, I like 
this one, especially the, there's an episode where I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but there's an episode involving Indian heritage. I'll just say that. That really just hooks me into the idea of who, what makes Miss Marvel different versus all the other superheroes in the Marvel universe so far. She's just a kid like Peter Parker, but she's also got this insane history behind her that is very unique. That it also brings up a lot of topics of okay, this is motivated by this, and this is motivated by this. Obviously, I'm dodging spoilers, but go check out Miss Marvel. You probably should anyway. It ties heavily into The Marvels, which is coming out on November 10th, so you should check it out anyways. And also, it, 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 seeing damage control, actually doing damage control is fun. Anyways, I'll move on. Number, what is this, number six? Infinity War. I think it did a really good job of bringing together a bunch of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, even the Guardians for the first time into the Avengers and saying, here's this big bad threat, we need to solve it. And it was probably one of the only MCU movies that I think, besides Civil War and Winter Soldier, that really took its comic bookiness to heart. Because... If you go back and read the comics for the what Thanos is all about, it's ridiculous. Granted, it was made in the 70s, the 80s. There's even Secret Wars, which is which we're coming up on in 2026 or something like that. That's also ridiculous, but it, it did something unique. You'll notice that as as we get further and further down, the less unique the projects get. But yeah, Infinity War, it's a banger. It cemented, oh, hey, here are all the characters you love. And then just really delivered on, okay, here's why Thanos is the threat. In fact, it's pretty much his movie, um, as many others have obviously said. And I just really enjoyed that aspect of it. The quippiness, I didn't really care for. I think I gave it, what did I give it? I gave it a... 4.5 out of 5. I know that's a little harsh, but I the, there are times where it, stuff doesn't make sense, especially with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, Black Panther. I initially did not like Black Panther. I think initially I had it somewhere in the 3, 3.5 range out of 5. M majorly because I think it relied a lot on just, hey, you need to know this and this. And it was stuffed with stuff from the comics that if you didn't know who Black Panther was going into this movie, you really needed to know some of that backstory in advance. Who Shuri is, what she's about, that whole thing. And where, to see where the story was going. Especially as we get to Wakanda Forever, a row down. But the more I more I watch Black Panther, the more I'm like, this is actually a really unique take on the superhero that's detached from everything. In fact, he's, as I said, I think in my Wakanda Forever review, Black Panther is one of the very few MCU heroes that is so detached from the MCU. You could almost take him out of the MCU, put him in his own franchise, and make a whole series of movies about Black Panther. You could make a War Dog spinoff. You could make a... You, you could do a whole thing with it. Yeah, War Dogs, Spy Dogs, something like that. I think it's called War Dogs. But anyways. And plus, Michael B. Jordan is always great. I loved his performance here. I'll be... I loved... Bozeman's more, but I think there was something richly, very richly detailed about Michael B. Jordan's performance in, as Killmonger. He wasn't just an ordinary villain, and I think that was one of my complaints, is that it wasn't more about him in the vein 
that Infinity War was about him. I, to the point, I think originally I didn't care about Black Panther. I cared more about Killmonger. So it was hard to latch on, so to speak, to Black Panther as being the next new guy, the next new big superhero that we're supposed to be following. But now I love it. I love it. And then uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. I love Spider-Man Homecoming for many of the reasons I love No Way Home. Spider-Man Homecoming was a very back-to-basics Spider-Man. It was, okay, we're not going to try to make a, an adult Spider-Man. This is an adult around the age that Peter Parker would be in high school. In fact, to the point where they actually made Tom Holland, the actor who plays Spider-Man, go undercover out of high school. And I think Tom Holland has an innate understanding of who Spider-Man is to the point that he embodies Spider-Man in a way that neither Tom Holland, not Tom Holland, Andrew Garfield, nor Tobey Maguire could. Tobey Maguire was a great Spider-Man. He was just ripped out of the comics. And Andrew Garfield was a good Peter Parker. Tom Holland puts those together, especially with the quips. I wish he did a little bit more clever quips, especially when he's talking to the vulture, but I digress. And in fact, I want, want to see once, if there is a Spider-Man 4, I do want to see a Peter Parker that may, maybe isn't a kid anymore and maybe dealing with adult issues. That would be nice for once. But yes, Homecoming was great. It built on the damage control aspect from, I believe it was Civil War, I believe was when they were introduced or was in this movie. No, great Spider-Man villains, dam damage control. And I, I just think the back to basics of Spider-Man works. Would I have liked something a little uh, more adult? Sure, but give what you get. And speaking of back to basics, Iron Man in 2008 is the next one up. And I don't think I have to explain why I love this movie. Everyone just loves this movie um, because it's the start of the MCU. But I just like it because it represents the Iron Man from the comics I remember. And I also believe there was a 2008 Iron Man, one second, while I plug in, while I plug in my laptop, there we go, all right, but there is a 2008, 2007, maybe, animated film from Marvel, a Marvel animation called The Invincible Iron Man, which is actually my introduction, which has a way better version of the Ten Rings than even Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings had. But Iron Man just worked for me. That That's pretty much all I can say about it. Captain America the Winter Soldier. I don't know what more I can say that hasn't already been said about this. It's a great spy thriller. It's a great just all-around Captain America movie. Just going all in on that Hydra element from that's been ever present since the first Captain America and it treats Captain America like a modern day character like a modern day spy and I think that's super interesting and it just works and this will be the first controversial pick Iron Man 3 is right after Winter Soldier for me because in my eyes originally I hated this I think I gave it a one star, one and a half star because of how it treats the Mandarin and the Ten Rings and not Hive, AIM. It treats AIM like a think tank and it just doesn't work for me in that aspect and it will probably never work for me. But I think as we are going on the 10 year anniversary of Iron Man 3, I think it works a little bit better in hindsight that this is the third movie, you've got to deconstruct it. In fact, we already got that with Thor Ragnarok. We got that in the future with Thor Ragnarok, I guess. 
Iron Man 3 came out first, then it was Thor Ragnarok. And it, I think this was last, except for Volume 3, I think. Yeah. I think Iron Man 3 was last third uh, because Captain America Civil so War was the third Captain America. But I can, uh, anyways. But yeah, it just works because it's okay. Let's deal with Tony Stark in a realistic way where he's defeated so many enemies, but he's still got a little bit of that PTSD from the year before and the Avengers that is so rightfully paid off in Infinity War and Endgame. Uh, I just think it treats Tony Stark more like a human than the other two Iron Mans. So yeah, it's up there for that very reason, because of its treatment of Tony Stark. Also, probably the same reason Captain America Civil War is up there, because it treats both sides, Team Cap and Team Iron Man, as two sides of the same argument, but it just they just fundamentally disagree on things. You could say, Team Cap, oh, we shouldn't need the Sokovia Accords. In fact, they get canceled or whatever happens when you undo a law later in She-Hulk, Attorney at Law. And, But you could see both sides, and I think that's why the Russos got called up to Infinity War and Endgame. But yeah, Civil War masterpiece. That last fight is great. Uh, then I think that's another controversial pick, and we'll be going downwards from here. We've got Wakanda Forever. I think the way that film deals with grief, uh, much like how Guardians of the Galaxy deals with grief, much how Iron Man 3 deals with PTSD, much how WandaVision deals with grief, I think it just works as my subtitle, for the review, it just is a funeral for a friend. It realizes, hey, this person that was Black Panther is gone in real life. Um, so we've got to find a way to move this sub franchise of Black Panther forward with Shuri. And it just it, it works, and in a way that isn't disrespectful. Then we have Captain America: First Avenger. It's all right. Not the greatest Captain America movie, obviously, since we have the other two up here. Um, but, yeah, Captain America First Avenger is really great. But, yeah, Captain America, great war movie. Then it's a great comic book movie. In fact, it's a little bit too comic booky, which I think is why I have it rated four out of five. Sometimes the comic bookiness can be a bit much for me. But, yeah, it's just... One of those things. Werewolf by Night, great horror movie by Michael Jack uh, Giacchino. Par apologies if I butchered that name, but he usually composes Marvel movies. He composed Spider-Man: Homecoming. I think he did No Way Home. I'm sure he's done at least one of the Avengers movies, but he's done a lot of them. And this was his first crack at directing. And Werewolf by Night is not a character I really even am aware of, really. However, I think this is a great introduction to be like, oh, hey, we now have a werewolf. We have our own little swamp thing. We have a supernatural side to the Marvel Universe. Um, and that, just for that alone was enough to be like, oh, this is really cool. And the style of it is really great. If you haven't seen it, go check it out on Disney+. Plus. I even think there's a making of documentary called Behind the Werewolf, or Director by Night, that's what it's called, on Disney+. Plus. Catch them both on Disney+. Plus. You won't regret it. Speaking of Disney+, Plus, the next one is She-Hulk Attorney at Law. And, yeah, this is a, a, one, another one of my controversial ones, but... I like Hulk, and I. this was fun. This was just fun for me, and sometimes I, a comic book thing should be allowed to be fun, especially when the comic book character it's based on is a really funny character in the comics. If they took Deadpool and made him, I don't know, serious, 
I feel like that a lot of people would revolt against that. And lo and behold, people did in X Men Origins, Wolverine, when he showed up there with no mouth. But yeah, it, it was. So, anyways, I loved it for that. Some of the things don't make sense, especially that last two episodes. But there's some really good social commentary here that I think really works, even if some of the plot threads don't necessarily connect in the greatest of ways. Um, speaking of things, we're starting to slope downhill. This is a slope where I'm like, okay, these are, you know, yes, these are three and a half or less, and they're really starting to decline in quality. Thor Ragnarok, I hated when I saw it. I saw it on opening night, Dolby Cinema, and I just hate what it does to the Thor character, but again, like with Iron Man 3, it, I turned around on it and said, this is a really good deconstruction of who Thor is as a person, and it works because of it, what it does to bring him closer to his comic book character and to really just hone down on what makes Thor. And I know that's a cliche statement, but I think it it works. Do I, do I really want Thor to keep quipping as much as he does here and in Love and Thunder? No, I don't like quippy Thor, but I understand it. You have to get quippy Thor here to get to quippy Thor in Infinity War and in and Endgame and then in Love and Thunder. It's just the direction Taika Waititi wanted to go. I prefer the Shakespearean bent of the original Thor, although that is goes it is a little bit worse in my opinion than Ragnarok. But anyhow, then we've got Far, Spider-Man: Far From Home. This one has some problems. Far From Home is a good movie but it falls apart the more you think about it. Okay, spoilers for four-year-old movie? Is this a four-year-old movie? Yeah, four years old. But Nick Fury and Bria Hill are scrolls in this movie. Mysterio is just a fake Mysterio, and it's just a disgruntled Stark employee who used BARF, gave the bad acronym BARF to his... Mysterio project, and it's just like that. Those parts don't really make sense to me at all, and it just it doesn't make sense to me. And but what it does for Spider Man, I really love. Hey, who can you really trust if you can't even trust the things before your very eyes? And for that, I for that I I really liked it. But for everything else. I didn't really like it. Maybe I'll go back and maybe a few of these will be knocked down. In fact, the only ones I rewatched for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 are Guardians of the Galaxy, of course, Infinity War, let's see, yeah, and a few others. Let's move on to the next page. Okay, ignore the Spider-Man 3 here. I'm just browsing the Marvel Studios page. Spider-Man 3 does get tend to be lumped into Marvel Studios for whatever reason, since it's a co-production. All right, first up we got Doctor Strange at number 19. Yeah, number 19, great movie, great wizardry, but like Far From Home and Ragnarok, the plot really falls apart. The more and more you think about it, why would... There's a lot of things that don't make sense in Doctor Strange, especially when you get to Multiverse of Madness, which you'll see at the bottom right. But yeah, it, it just really does not make sense. Why, what is the obsession with the Time Stone? What is all this? It, I really feel like another 15 minutes could have been used to really flesh it out and really cement, okay, here's why the people are doing the things they're doing. And yeah. Then Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings. I like this movie. It's fun. However, the plot makes no sense. You're just going one place to another without any rhyme or reason, in my opinion. And it really just 
harms every aspect of the movie. It's a great first outing, but yeah, it's not great. Same thing goes for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I'll talk a bit more in depth on my exact problems with this movie a, a little bit after we go through our rankings, but there's some things in the plot that just don't necessarily make sense to me. It, 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 I'll just say that. Then we've got the Loki TV show, great movie, it's a great TV show. It's the thing is, it just gets a little bit too much like Doctor Who from time to time. Great series, just a little convoluted. Black Widow, this will be the first movie where I think we start to get to unnecessary te territory. I get they have to introduce Yelena in this movie and a bunch and Black Widow's family, but it just didn't click with me. It just didn't click at all, especially considering when it's supposed to be taking place. Same thing with Captain Marvel. I would argue that you could have used another movie to really set up her journey to become Captain Marvel because 90% of this, if not more, may, uh, maybe 90% is too much, but a good majority of this movie is just flashbacks and I really didn't like that. I don't like how Brie Larson acts as Captain Marvel. Uh, and it's nothing against Brie Larson. I think it's just how it, Captain Marvel is written that's really bad. Uh, I won't go into the YouTube essay format here, but I just think it was a missed opportunity. To, maybe we could focus less on the things that make... Captain Marvel different from every other cosmic superhero and mate and put her on Earth and put it in the 1990s and maybe we could have focused more on hey she's this intergalactic superhero why is she important that, that that's critical for an origin movie for me I need to know why these people are important so I'll care about them I need to know what makes them different and I need to know their origin story I feel like if you re-edit a Captain Marvel, you actually have a good movie in there. In fact, some of the deleted scenes are fantastic. I think it's just the directors, I forget their names. I don't think they had a lot of experience underneath their belt when they went into this, so they didn't have a lot of say, and maybe Marvel overstepped a little bit. Same thing, I think studio interference got in the way of Ant-Man and the Wasp, which is the next one up. It just feels dragged down by all the Civil War stuff that was introduced and does, forgets to be its own movie. It's 90, so I keep saying 90%. Probably 60% of it is, hey, we, Scott, we, we need to deal with the fallout of Civil War, and 40% of it is, here's the main plot of the movie. And that's too little, too late by the time we get to that subplot. So, yeah, I just really didn't like it. I think I rated it, what did I rate this? Three out of five. It's still enjoyable. The humor really does it, but there's just a lot of stuff, unanswered questions about what happened between movies, considering there's four, two years between movies, I think. Yeah, two years. Oh, let's see, when did this come out? 2018? Three years between movies, and it's okay. But this is set right after Civil War. It, it was all confusing. Speaking of confusing, Moon Knight, the TV show. I love Moon Knight. I was so happy for him to get his own series on Disney+. Plus. A little upset that it's only six episodes or something like that. But, I, in fact, I reviewed all of them. But it just... It really plays fast and loose with the mechanics of how everything works and sometimes just doesn't execute well. Same thing goes with Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Great first three episodes, and then it just goes downhill, and then it peaks at the finale. Same could be said for Hawkeye. I'll just lump those three together. They're all very similar feeling. And, yeah, it just... Those were not great. They had great moments, 
especially Falcon and the Winter Soldier, that the episode before the finale was pretty good. But yeah, in Hawkeye, there's a few good episodes in there, especially concerning Echo. But yeah, there's just that there there was some meddling or something going on with the script that I didn't like. Then my moving on to my next controversial opinion, Avengers Endgame is better than Avengers. Okay, that's not my controversial opinion. My controversial opinion is that I like Endgame less than Infinity War. And that's because I'm putting it just under Hawkeye. Because I think everything from the time heist to the ending is too convoluted for me to really under, not understand, but to really grab onto and to really say, oh, this is a thing that makes sense. This is obviously the logical conclusion. In fact, it, but instead, it feels like things just happen in this movie instead of like happening to, to mo- these characters instead of happening because of these characters. And whereas Infinity War happened because of these characters. So uh, it just didn't feel like there was a cause and effect there. Then in Avengers was just an utter garbled mess for me. It was just pe- the cinematic equivalent of mushing two action figures together and a kid does. Much in the same way Volume 2 does. It's, hey, we have Ego now. What are we going to do with him? Absolutely nothing. And then we're going to just try and break up the Guardians because that's gonna, we need to have a central conflict. And it just really doesn't make sense. It takes a lot of detours it doesn't need to make. Same goes for Age of Ultron. In fact, the ultimate detour movie. I feel like you could have just went from... It spends too much time setting up in later installments to really get anywhere. I think same goes for Eternals and Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Spends way too much time setting up Blade, setting up, um, I think, Loki Season 2 and Quantumania. Way too much time focused on the future instead of being their own good movies. And then this is going to be the speed round because these are the true baddies. We're starting off at what? We're starting off at a 2 out of 5. Thor Love and Thunder. Um, I do not know what happened to this movie. Gore the God Butcher doesn't even really butcher a god on screen. The theologics of it really don't make sense. The plot doesn't make sense. Nothing about this makes sense. It is a big CGI fest that I I barely remember. Same thing goes for the pre- Thor 2, Thor of the Dark World. I really didn't vibe with this one. I would have loved Malekith if they had done more with him, but they didn't. Quantum Mania only serves to set up phases 4 through 6 and really wastes a lot of the characters, including the apparent aging up of Cassie Lang. Incredible Hulk, while I have defended it, um, while it is probably my favorite Hulk-centric movie, really just doesn't make sense. There's a lot of detours that in this that don't make sense, especially the romance subplot and how it's vaguely connected to the Ang Lee Hulk that came out in 2003. The holiday special really doesn't make sense other than as a filler between Volume 2 and Volume 3. Thor, while I love the Shakespearean stuff, really doesn't vibe with me any other way. There's like constant touch angles that make me want to vomit. Iron Man 2 is just a filler for the Avengers. In fact, I think the this one, or even maybe Captain America, includes a trailer for the Avengers at the end of it in the, as the end credit screen. But yeah, it's, it's just that. So that's my MCU rankings, and I may have to speed things up here. But so let's get to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 thoughts. So I love Guardians of the Galaxy uh, Volume 3. It's up there with Loki and Shang-Chi, Doctor Strange. However, it 
I think it, this falls into the MCU movie that kind of forgets that it needs to be about everyone equally. I won't give too many spoilers away, but a large majority of this doesn't deal with um, things from Volume 2, like, okay, what's going on with Gamora since Infinity War? What's going on with Groot since Infinity uh, Endgame? What's going on with these characters? It really is lackluster in that aspect. And really, the theories I had were probably better than the actual movie. So it's just one of those things, lofty expectations, that sort of thing. And I think that maybe what harmed it. And, but I think maybe on a rewatch, I might like it a bit more. So that's all I can really say without spoiling it. So let's move on to my Jedi Survivor thoughts. I haven't completed the campaign. I'm about 27 hours in and change. First things first, I hate these puzzles. They're way... I finished Fallen Order in 15 hours. It feels like some of the puzzles are there just to be there as, a, hey, we need this random obstacle to occur so that the player can spend 30 minutes here trying to figure out what to do next. And there's like shrine-like areas, a lot of Breath of the Wild. I think they're called Jedi Chambers in this. The story is really good, though. I really like the story. It just really hammers home, hey, it's been five years since Fallen Order. Here's how Cal's changed. Here's how the crew of the Stinger Mantis has changed. Here's how the world of Star Wars has changed. In fact, it takes place at the same time as Kenobi, which I thought was interesting, or the same year, I think, as Kenobi. So surprised I that... Uh, that n no cameo happened in Kenobi. That's a bit surprising, but I'm running into, other than that, the puzzles are a big obstacle for me. The combat feels a bit slippery at times, but other than that, I'm enjoying it. I think when I'm playing the story, I, I enjoy it, but when I'm just doing the grindy things like looking for chests, looking for cosmetics, looking for bosses to defeat on Kobo, which I think is a really cool place. It just doesn't work for me in, in, in the free roam aspects. So maybe in a third game, Star Wars Jedi, Empire, or whatever, um, it, it, it would be very... I would love to see some expansion on that. But stay tuned. I'll have spoiler warnings for both Jedi Survivor and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, where I can talk a little bit more about my thoughts there. That's a Patreon exclusive, so if you're not a patron already, go to patreon.com slash awesomebmedia or awesomebmedia slash support or join.awesomebmedia. And it'll get you all there whichever way. You only need to do a dollar a month and you get access, I think. With that said, let's do some rapid-fire thoughts on some t shows I've been watching. True Lies, which will have its series finale tonight. I thought it was going to get it renewed, but it did not. CBS was not interested in that at all. And look, before you say it, I know. True Lies is a dumb show. It is a dumb show. It is so dumb. However, True Lies is my favorite dumb show because it doesn't ask anything of the audience at all. It just says, hey, here's the mission this week. Let's go. And he here's some fun stuff with Ginger Gonzaga. Gonzaga? Gonzaga? I, I can never pronounce her name right. So, someone correct me in the YouTube comments or on Spotify. How do you pronounce her name? But she's in this too. I loved her in She-Hulk Attorney at Law. But yeah, I just... 
I'm super sad it's ending uh, because it was so simplistic that I feel like it could have gone on as as long as The Blacklist has. The Blacklist has been on 10 seasons now, and it really doesn't offer anything of, of substance other than here's the villain this week, which I feel is how True Lies is. So I'm really sad to see it go. I, Although I'll, I'll be watching the series finale tonight, or tomorrow morning. I, I just hope it's good. I would have loved to see a season two, but because I think everyone, Gib, the actor who plays Gib, the guy who plays Harry, even though it's not like a one-to-one adaptation of the movie, in fact, the opening credits say it's actually based on a film called La, La Total, which I think is Spanish. But, yeah, it... Uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted a second season, but I'm never going to get it. One se- series I wish would end is Ted Lasso. Really briefly, Ted Lasso season three, maybe I'll do a spoiler warning on it. Let me know if you want me to do that. Um, in fact, I think I am doing a spoiler warning on that. Um, next week or whenever it ends i think on the 31st ted lasso season three has not been great it's done some stuff with nate that really doesn't follow up on where we left nate in season two or any really any of the characters it just jumps forward six months or something like that at the beginning of the season and really we've got two episodes left and i don't really feel like it's gone anywhere and that's a real big problem when this is being touted as maybe the last season of Ted Lasso. And and another thing I'll say in brief, because I do have a me- meeting in about six minutes I've really got to make. Ted Lasso really is leaning hard into the drama aspects, whereas the f- first two seasons were comedy and these are an hour long instead of 30 minutes long, which I appreciate since it's technically giving us twice the length. Uh, twice, basically two seasons in one. So it's like basically season three and season four. But it's not really doing anything with that length. It's not really doing anything with that drama. There's maybe one in, once an episode I choke up and then it's oh, back, back to just doing nothing again. There's something that happened this week that I was just like, oh, so we spent all... 20 minutes setting this up, another 20 minutes, and then it gets resolved in five minutes. Great. That's not what I wanted. And speaking of what I didn't want, a few weeks ago on Star Wars Day, they released another Simpson short with Maggie Simpson called Maggie Simpson and Rogue Not Quite One. As those of you who have read my letterbox review already know, I hated this short. Um, it just really didn't do anything for me. It was just, here's nostalgia, here's nostalgia, clap, please. And really, don't watch it. But if you do, I've got links to watch the short, Ted Lasso, True Lies. You can buy the Jedi Survivor game. You can get tickets to Guardians of the Galaxy. I've got links to everything in the description. And speaking of links, here are some things I recently posted. I'm, I've been going all in on Tribeca. I've got the following Tribeca articles up. I've got the games lineup, the immersive lineup, the talks and reunions lineup, a new documentary got added to the feature film lineup, and as well as additional programming and the return of the Tribeca Music Lounge for the second year. And then I detailed what is happening at Phase 4 of Austin B Media, which You should also have seen already because it's already on my YouTube channel and I think everywhere else. But with that said, I have to go into a meeting right now. So thanks for listening to the Austin B Media podcast. I have been your host, Austin Belzer. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to either my YouTube channel or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a place on your podcast app where you can leave a rating and review, I'd greatly appreciate it. It helps out with SEO and all those sorts of things like discoverability. And in the interim, you can follow me on social media, Austin B Media, everywhere except for Twitter because they will not let me get the at Austin B Media Twitter handle. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. (laughs) 